This video will spoil in part the following stories. There is also a content warning for a very brief mention of cancer. I've had this one video essay germinating in my head for months and months now, and it's ultimately the inspiration for this video. It's called In Defense of Nicolas Cage by In Praise of the Shadows. In it, the essayist describes how Cage's non-naturalistic style of acting is not only a valid way to be an actor, but is actually a particularly effective way of creating catharsis in the viewer. Nick Cage doesn't act the way a person in a cinematic situation would act because real people obfuscate emotions, or they feel conflicting emotions, or they have long and winding paths behind them that affect the most minute ways in which they express themselves. That also means that no two people express their emotions in the same way anyway. Cage, instead, reaches past how real people act to wrangle in something like pure emotionality. He's not going to show you what he looks like when he's angry, or what his character looks like when they're angry. He's going to show you what anger looks like. In the video, a quotation by Cage elaborates on the term he coined, called nouveau shamanic acting, inspired by Brian Bates, The Way of the Actor. Thousands of years ago, the medicine men, or the tribal shamans, were really actors. What they would do is they would act out whatever issues were with the villagers at the time. They would act it out and try to find the answers, or go into a trance, or go into another dimension, which is really just the imagination, and try to pull out something that would reflect the concerns of the group. Good acting provokes catharsis in the viewer. Not being able to express oneself is frustrating, and sometimes we need someone trained in feeling feelings to do that on our behalf. Have you ever cried with an actor and then continued crying after the scene was over? You weren't just being empathetic, I don't think. Your empathy was harnessed and extrapolated upon by the artist. The actor helped expose you to the thing that you were feeling. My work here today will be to show you why I think the work of Let's Players can be comparable to those of actors, and by doing that I hope to explain how I think this genre can grow. There is a ton of artistic potential in Let's Plays, and I think we've only scratched the surface. There are ways a Let's Play can be good or bad beyond the gamer's skill level or ability to be funny on command. There are other feelings a Let's Play can evoke in a viewer, and they can do this without pre-playing or engaging in very intellectual discourse or pouring their hearts out. It takes a willingness to understand the developer's vision and a vulnerability to actually complete that vision. Because to play a game is to write a story that a creator can only assemble the pieces for. To set inert potential into motion, to build a dream in reality. To fulfill a part of the game's furthest dream, assigned to you when that dream was born. And in keeping yourself with play, you are in truth loving life. And to love life through play is to be intimate with life's inmost secret. And I want to argue that for much of this field, that's not really happening yet. What I see from Let's Players nowadays is a lot more sort of... Yeah. I feel like my mom, my mom never wanted to be in the same room with us when we were watching cartoons because she didn't want to hear all that screeching. Like, that's all cartoons were to her, just montages of people screaming. And now I'm doing this video and I'm like, you dang Let's Players making a ruckus on my lawn. You rotten kids with your video games. But I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum. I'm actually here to demonstrate that I think there is incredible creative potential in this medium. And I'm also gonna make fun of a few rich people, because that's always on the docket somewhere. One of my earliest experiences with Let's Plays was PewDiePie's playthrough of The Walking Dead. Gaming is a weird form of art because, more so than any other common medium, it involves a level of technique that needs to be honed. Like, your fine motor skills, your reaction time, that sort of thing. Whereas anyone can get better at movies by paying attention, being emotionally attentive, doing research, games require a physical level of adeptness of which one can have more or less. I'm really bad at most games, mostly because I have very slow reflexes and I tend to interpret instructions very strangely. I don't know why, it's just a thing I do. So I've seen a lot of Let's Plays. Throughout the first season of that game, Felix begins to feel and think the way Lee does, specifically about Clementine. 
From afar, he takes on a sort of paternal instinct for her. He develops a little nickname for her. He loves her because he is empathizing with Lee. And when, spoiler alert for season one of The Walking Dead games, Lee dies, Felix just breaks down. <laughs> oh, fuck that. And like, this is an emotional scene. It's properly built up to, it's sad, it's dark. But all I seem to be able to remember concretely about that video is that Felix actually sobs on camera. I think there's a certain quality to drama that is experienced collectively. And maybe like the shamans of old, Let's players perform a social role that becomes artistic through performance. For me, watching him cry was a cathartic moment. Because you need social permission to feel intense emotions, and empathy is a way to bypass our own baggage. I can't cry at a video game, because I don't want the other boys to beat me up. And so I separate myself from it. But Felix doesn't. Or at least he doesn't in this performance. So he makes way for me to feel the things that I really should be feeling while consuming art. It's not about Felix being some brilliant critic commenting on the game to explain why we should be crying. He's making his own product, using the half-realized material of the game to create a really deeply affecting experience, just like a movie or a piece of music. To illuminate some of the strengths of Let's Plays as an artistic medium, I want to show you two examples of gaming-adjacent experiences that are similar to, but definitely not, Let's Plays. And while they are both very beautiful pieces that I would really recommend checking out, they don't capture the unique dramatic potential of a Let's Play. At no point am I going to derogate these other pieces or their creators. The reasons they stuck out to me are because they are absorbing and memorable and fun. They both do what they are trying to do remarkably well, and I wouldn't change a thing about them. I'm just saying that they fulfill roles outside this nouveau shamanic designation that I think Let's Players do, or can, fulfill. Pathologic. For those who will never play it. The first not Let's Play is a more literal example of what an intentional gaming acting situation might be. And it's appropriate because acting is actually a central theme throughout the work, as well as the work that it's based on. Let's talk about Codex Entry's Pathologic for those who will never play it. These are some of my favorite videos on the internet. If ContraPoints had never made the hunger, it might be tied for first. This series is, naturally, a reenactment of the 2005 Russian survival game Pathologic. It uses voice actors to guide how the unspoken text of the game should or can be read by viewers. And Ruby Seal's own voice is used as a non-diegetic embodiment of Daniil, demonstrating how the player might come to relate to him. Pathologic is, among other things, about the ways our experience with the world is changed by our own histories, passions, and fears. The Bachelor is a lofty big shot who sees the individual hardships of common folks as an impediment to the advancement of medicine. Not as a science, but as a tool for glimpsing some metaphysical truth beyond our limiting human bodies. More specifically, medicine is a tool toward his own personal project of abolishing death. Through Ruby, the viewer sees how Daniel's thoughts evolve into the perception of someone who ends up taking some pretty monstrous actions in the service of a noble, maybe, goal. The Bachelor is willing, eager almost, to let an entire town of people die because it stands in the way of his own hubristic disbelief in the absolute certainty of death. He suffers humiliation and fear and pain, and it all drives him toward one tragically stupid conclusion. To destroy the town. The town's soil, people, and beliefs are a social cancer that he wants to keep from spreading. Ruby does a fantastic job explaining the beats and intention of what is a fairly difficult story to empathize with. Pathologic is not always transparent about things like feelings. These characters keep their motivations hidden and their beliefs abstract. Each is a slave to an ideological destiny that they want to see realized. And they don't always care when their actions are self-destructive or unnecessarily cruel. And while this is really fascinating on an intellectual level, the aims of the developers are only realized if we accept their invitation to step into the minds of these characters that we are being invited to study. We can get there too, with a lot of toil, we can feel these characters becoming integrated into our minds. 
Ruby and the various actors who brought this game to life did an excellent job, and though she insists at the very end that, really, this is no supplement for just playing the game itself, I think she actually adds something special to the experience of Pathologic. The execution of the final product works in two ways. Ruby uses the introduction of the videos to discuss a theatrical theory that will be relevant to the game. Artaud's theater of cruelty, Brecht's estrangement theory, and Beckett's tragic comedy are all explained clearly in the three current videos. This informational section is followed by a full reenactment of the game. This is really helpful because Pathologic is doing its damnedest to make the experience absolutely inexplicable. On one hand, they lean heavily on Arto's theory of cruelty, using pain and fear and stress to push the player into an emotionally active state, an empathetic state. Arto believed in the mysticism of theater, because the stirring power of watching a story unfold with real human bodies in a tangible space wakes you up from the mind-numbing malaise most of us spend our days in. Artaud took the easy road in, showing the audience gruesome images, putting actors through physical trials to force empathy, and probably extreme concern in the audience members. But games are a new kind of stage. Not only are you in the room with the ones overcoming the trials, you now become the player overcoming said trials. As Ruby points out, you become an actor helping the developers complete the creation. Arto actually wanted to make use of painful lights and sounds to torture the audience into an immersive, ecstatic experience. But that's nothing compared to what Pathologic is able to do. The developers do all kinds of intense and complicated stuff to force immersion. The economy collapses overnight and you need food to live. You have to kill children for economic benefit. You have to handle organs and blood constantly. Poor Artemy. It's way more disturbing and therefore engaging than anything you can do in a theater. You become the character in a way analogous to how an actor does. You come to understand instinctively the motivations and fears of the character as you play. The character lives in you as a result, jumping into your mind to become immortal. On the other hand, we have the estrangement effect in full force. At every other turn, the game is telling you to remember that you are, in fact, playing a game, and that the characters are being dumb. Being represented as an actor isn't immersing on this side of the coin, it's actually alienating. You're tasked with discovering immortality. But what if we just, like, change the plot of your story and crush your character's dreams on day one? You think you just died? Well, what if you wake up in a theater as though you were an actor just finishing your last scene? You think this climactic decision you're about to make will have great import? What if I told you that you literally aren't even a person, and nothing you do matters at all? You are reminded in every possible instance that you aren't supposed to get too comfy in this world. This isn't an immersive experience, it's a learning experience. And learning sucks. It's for nerds. Two very different methods are at work here, discussed in conjunction to help the viewer see how differing methods of perceiving the same reality coexist and yet remain distinct in our minds. Points of view aren't insignificant or immaterial, they construct the world as we know it. All of this can be felt by any player, but will it be felt by most players? I had never heard of Arto before Ruby's video. And yet his idea of the theater of cruelty is integral to understanding the effect the game is going for. Would I have been sensitive to this effect without that knowledge? Or would I just have interpreted the hardships as unnecessary cruelty for the sake of being shocking and sensational, and the arcane language as just being confusing storytelling? Not only that, but considering how hard Pathologic is and the inherent exclusivity of that, that experience is inaccessible to anybody who can't get past day two. Watching Pathologic in a no-commentary walkthrough is not going to give you a chance to feel the agony of making those choices, or the vexation of failure at every possible turn. Ruby not only provides the history and philosophy necessary to interpreting the creator's intentions, she simulates the hardships of the game by supplementing it with her acting. And not just her acting, she just straight up gives us information that we will miss by not playing ourselves. So, I actually made this look way easier than it really is. For you see, this cupboard right here is too low to walk under and basically acts as a wall. So you actually have very little space to work with when you're trying to get around them. Meanwhile, if either of these women so much as touch you, 
then you get to be one of the earliest patients of the plague, which, spoilers, makes the game a lot harder. Trust me when I tell you that it's very easy to get infected here, and this will most likely be the first place in the game where you get intimately familiar with Pathologic's unique brand of save scumming. Maybe you're not spending hours on soul-crushing walks between locations or dying over and over again in fights you can barely ascertain the purpose of, but you are processing language that expresses that agony for you. Everyone else dies screaming. I'm done. I am done. I am officially giving up on the idea that anyone here is deserving a better than a bullet. This place is an unholy nightmare. You know, I try to be a nice person. I try to resolve shit without resorting to violence, like an ethical human should. But nobody really wants me to have that option. It's a bit like watching a movie, or really more like binge watching a show. But beyond just explaining the gameplay we couldn't feel, she also takes the liberty of explaining the significance of moments for the player that a more passive viewer might miss. Alexander seems to pick up on the fact that all of this talk of mystic step creatures and clairvoyance may be a bit much for the scientifically minded bachelor to swallow. So he points you to a local mathematician named Yulia, the only other person in town who may be just as skeptical as Daniel. So you go to speak with her, and the first thing she says to you is, I seem to have lost any capacity for observation. My mind is out of tune. Things no longer add up. Before, I had no trouble forming a trustworthy tessellation out of the imperceptible contingencies. Now I simply cannot get my head around it. Could it be that I'm dying? Yes, it definitely means you're about to die. <laughs> The game tells you, hey, here's another person just like you. Talk to them. They'll help you make sense of all this weirdness. And the first thing that person tells you is, I have no fucking clue what's happening. I feel like I'm losing my goddamn mind. I'm dying. Help. And the bachelor can just be like, yes. Fucking art. I have seen no commentary playthroughs of Pathologic, and I never grasped the irony of this. Probably because watching naturally engenders moment-to-moment -moment observation, whereas a player has to forcefully propel the story forward with motivation. So the entire infamously irritating walk from the Subarovs to Yulia's, you're thinking, cool, 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 someone's gonna offer me a reasonable theory to contradict the mystical ramblings of these charlatans and crackpots, and then you get there and your expectations and hopes and dreams just go up in smoke. There's a lot of that in this series, actually. Ruby being the emotionally and intellectually active agent in this playthrough because we're entering a comatose state from staring at our computers, trying not to think about the inner darkness. Yes, I watched these videos on my computer like a mensch. Ruby includes in her video the mission statement by Ice Pick Lodge about what their games really are at their core. Our job is to set the stage, redefine the laws of the world, introduce the problem, and point out how its core connects with everyday reality. The players do the rest, completing the act by virtue of their unique interpretations. This is something that we get to watch Ruby do, very thoughtfully too. But I think I have to argue that there is a difference between watching someone craft a story and listening to someone intentionally making that story accessible to you. That is to say, the decisions Ruby makes in her run-through imply that we make the decisions with her that we complete the act with our interpretations. But that isn't what's happening. We aren't involved at all. We're all pretending Ruby isn't in the room with us, holding up our side of the arrangement on our behalf. And that's great for her purposes, as someone trying to fully explain what we miss, but not for mine, at least not in this video. To reiterate, I do hope I've made it very clear that Codex Entry did a fantastic job creating an experience that expresses what the developers wanted to do. I wouldn't change a single thing about the final product, and I am on pins and needles waiting for the Haruspex route to come out, though I do hope she takes all the time she needs to make it. All I'm saying is that Pathologic, for those who will never play it, is not the story of actually playing the game, nor is it really the story of Ruby Seals plays Pathologic. Game isn't a particularly apt term here, is it? Indeed, Ruby invites us to think of the video as a play. This necessitates explaining gameplay, when crucial to the effect the game is going for, filling in gaps that an active player would experience 
that a passive viewer would miss, monologuing about the specificities of the main character's feelings so we can understand their motivations. At least, the motivations Ruby thinks the creators think we should be having. In doing this, the viewers miss something big, as Ruby herself reminds us several times. We miss our own chance to create the character's destiny from our own motivations in response to the story. Ruby's series is so effective precisely because it ignores half the story, the story of the player playing the game. But we also don't see Ruby playing a game either. We see her performing, composing, tailoring the experience of this particular game to work without gameplay. We don't see her authentically taking on the Bachelor's insane ideas. We see her explaining how she imagines one might do that. This is why I really don't think of this piece as a let's play. It's an adaptation, and for all its strengths, there are some things it just can't do. We will get more into this later on, but a let's play is a lot more analogous to the feeling of playing a game. And a good let's play, or at least the ones that I like, work on elevating and synthesizing the sensations of playing for an audience member. Not so much because the viewer themselves won't be playing the game, but because watching someone play is a unique and worthwhile experience. A Let's Player cannot give you these reasoned and researched explanations of what is happening on a deeper level. You theoretically go in dark right alongside them. The reaction you get isn't going to be measured with the goal of approximating the experience intellectually and emotionally. It's not in the mind or in the heart. It's visceral. Let's players simulate what it's like to experience the unraveling of the player's story. The story of the player playing the game, the Ludo narrative. They fill in gaps we can't see with acting, not explanation. I should probably amend this statement, actually. I didn't mean to categorize all Let's Plays as being totally spontaneous and not involving any planning. Chugga Conroy seems to do a ton of groundwork in getting ready to present his gameplay experiences. I am saying that this spontaneous method is what I am suggesting holds particular potential as a supplementary piece of art to experience with or instead of a game. Chugga Conroy doesn't go in blind, and as a result, his own spontaneous expressions are cool and sort of dry. I've not seen a lot of this kind of content, mainly because I'm, I'm just not that interested in it. I'm not trying to shit on this creator or anyone who produces work in a similar style. Not at all. I'm just saying that this method doesn't allow for the virtues of a spontaneous let's play, where simulating a player's experience takes precedence over information about that experience. But before we get into what those virtues are, we are going to talk about one more non-let's play. Am I doing this? I think I am. Yeah, I'm doing this. Okay. <sighs> How does one go about starting something like this? <laughs> hey guys, it's Wacky Will! Welcome to my Let's Play! No, not doing that. Diminish is another moving and stunning gaming adjacent experience that also lives on YouTube and doesn't involve the player going in blind. In the words of creator Seria, Diminish is an immersive narrative drama with horror elements mainly told through a YouTube web series. Diminish is a fictional story told with the conceit of a playthrough. Uh, technically unfictional, but that's literally the opposite of what, what I'm trying to say, so I don't really want to say that. Will is a 26-year-old playing a video game made for him four years ago by his twin sister Teddy in the months before she died of leukemia. Saria created this project by making his own game and then doing a Let's Play in character as Will. He ad-libs his lines as he, in real life, struggles to get through what honestly looks like a bitch of a game. We know a lot about the alleged artist through the player. Will is a young adult who is still grieving the tragic loss of his sister, and who his sister was and the whole context of their relationship is slowly laid out to us through Will. This is really interesting to me because it removes a lot of the initial work an audience member would do in a normal ARG. Like, from the moment you see that menu screen with the words, a game for my brother, with that sad music playing in the background, you kinda have all the parts you need to construct a plausible backstory. So you go in with the expectation that the game may at times refer to the person playing by name and may be able to predict certain things about them. A different ARG would probably leave that open as a mystery horror element, but because we have this information, it's not scary. It's not even a twist. It's 
sweet and affecting and sad. Despite the dark and difficult emotions inherent to this project, Diminish is fundamentally kind and relenting. It's absolutely worth checking out, although you should pace yourself because the tonal whiplash can be distressing at times. But you'll know what you're in for in episode one, and say hi to me in the comments. I'm in there somewhere. Besides the fact that Diminish is a piece of fiction, there is another subtler way that this varies from a real Let's Play. While Will is actually playing and struggling to beat and explore the game, he is not doing so with the expectation that we will primarily be engaging with the game. We don't really watch the web series to interpret Teddy's creative intentions. We're here to watch Will explore those intentions for us, since he can freely provide us with the uppermost level of subtext. Teddy died too young, leaving the less extroverted Will to enter adulthood alone. Teddy was a tryhard, and Will thinks she spent too much of her life caring about what other people thought. Will even undercuts Teddy's authority, spelling it out for us that she, as the creator, is not the only one who gets to decide what the audience should take away from the game. I'm not pressing B. I just don't understand. I, I mean, that's not that's not true. I mean, I... she treated she treated the way she was feeling while she was dying like she was being graded for it, like like if she didn't die the right way. Why didn't you focus on yourself first? I could have figured all this out on my own. Why, why didn't you, why didn't you? I was gonna be confused no matter what. I was gonna be confused after you were gone. I was gonna be confused when I saw what you put in the game. I, you did not force me into shit, okay? Listen to me. You did not force me into pressing A. You did not force me into pressing start. All this time that, <laughs> All this time, you, you were the one who was listening to them. You were the one who was letting all their bullshit dictate the way that you lived your life. The entire time, it was dictating the way that you lived your death. You died the exact way that they wanted you to. Teddy pulls Will through a grueling gameplay experience to force him into the mindset of someone who will keep pushing past pain and frustration and ennui to get to something better on the other side. In the short time they had together, Teddy saw the way Will had to learn how to hide his interests and purported faults. Eventually, he preferred to live in her shadow. She was the successful, charming, and prolific twin, and Will was her brother. Amidst bullying from other kids for his pretty mild eccentricities, he relented under social pressure, tacitly opting into a smaller life with fewer joys. Teddy wants to teach him how to persevere throughout the hardships to achieve his own personal goals. In other words, he needs to learn will. The web series presents a game that almost acts like a little oasis that death can't get to. Teddy, her thoughts and passions and intentions her motivations and her love for her brother, even her way of thinking and speaking, are all preserved. Will at times interacts with her as if he were getting an opportunity to talk with her on borrowed time. He is ecstatic to talk to his sister again, though he is just as often angry and annoyed with her. They are getting a chance to experience the truest form of art. In the end, it's a conversation that does away with the arbitrarily limited toolset of talking and body language. She can force him into her mind with about as much specificity as mankind is currently capable of. She gets to guide his experience towards her aims with her words and her poetry, but Saria strikes a nice balance between offering us Teddy's words and allowing us to see what she is really trying to do get Will to change his thinking through learned behavior. Teddy's words are really mainly for the audience's benefit. Sure, they act as incentive for Will to keep going, he desperately wants to talk to her again, but mostly they are a check-in device for us to get into Will's head. As he gets into the spirit of the game, accepting the torture of it all, we really get to see his readiness to engage with Teddy, considering how he starts off pretty reticent. 
I want to compare this piece to the kinds of Let's Plays I am interested in because it gets at all the strengths of turning playing a game into art without actually presenting a model that Let's Players can learn from. Like, this is first and foremost a piece of drama, right? Or a meditation on death, what it really means to die, how the dead can live and how the living can behave as though they were dead. But it is at all times about how interacting with a piece of art is special. Art is a form of communication, and this web series reflects upon the many implications of that. Diminish does something that Pathologic, for those who will never play it, can't really do. While it's true that both simulate this conversation between artist and player, Codex Entry's piece isn't really trying to get the audience immersed into the idea that this is Ruby adopting the beliefs of Daniil Dankowski. In fact, she even says at the end of the playthrough that she thinks The Bachelor's conclusion is monstrous. <laughs> Which is correct, by the way. She is right about that. Also, we don't see Ruby actually fulfill the vision of the game. We don't see her physically struggle with gameplay until she feels like she is the Bachelor. We don't see her struggling to understand text in real time, or reacting to peculiarities as though she were seeing them for the first time. Again, not a criticism, that wasn't her job here. But in Diminish, we see Will hold up his end of the conversation with Teddy through actual suffering at the hands of this insane rage game. I would love to see more of Diminish, like, yes, both the web series itself and other projects that draw inspiration from it, but that's not all. I think Diminish demonstrates some tools that can make more mundane, genuine Let's Plays shine. Emotional vulnerability, a willingness to understand, not to struggle through text like an essayist, but to react and hold up one's end of the conversation on the player's side of the game. Diminish shows us what it looks like for Ice Pick Lodge's mission statement to be fulfilled in a public setting, where people can witness this fully performed piece of art. Will's presence is integral to this piece. He is the only one being spoken to directly, and aren't we all when we're playing a game? I picked both of these projects because they are both trying to elevate your average Let's Play. Ruby Seals shows us how to intellectually engage with the visions of our games, not just as little units of entertainment, but as pieces of art that are trying to communicate with us. Saria's Diminish shows us how watching a person complete this vision of dialogue between creator and player can be moving and genuine and alive. I think the next step we have to take is to discuss a real Let's Play, and how they work at their best. How does a skilled gamer complete a developer's vision while performing for an audience? As I was making my last video about Criminal Minds, sorry for the audio by the way, I watched a lot of material of Mandy Patankin's acting. And that was a real treat because I just think he's one of the most talented actors of our time. I think when you watch a good actor doing their job, you're not exactly turning off your brain to allow them to interpret the text for you. You are definitely doing that, but you're also learning how a pro interprets text, and learning more about your own reading as a result. A good actor may take work off your hands in the moment, but they leave you with more work to do after the dazzling spectacle of it. They enrich a text rather than watering it down for easy consumption. And a Let's Player can do the same thing. They teach us how to experience games well. They reach into these elusive sensations that we can have while playing games, and give them shape and dimension so that we can learn how to do this. If an actor teaches us how to reach emotions beyond the obfuscating factors of normal human expression, is it not also true that a gamer can access the same on our behalf? Not so that we don't have to go in search of those experiences ourselves, but to witness that kind of catharsis from someone who might be better at embodying it than we are. I think it's about time we get into an actual example of a Let's Play. We're only 25 minutes into this, we have time. I have so much to say about Markiplier in this topic, it's honestly a little embarrassing. I'm a 28 year old man. So first I'm going to use him as an example of Let's Plays at their best. And then I'm going to use him as an example of Let's Plays at their worst. And at some point in all that, I'm going to get really dark and cynical about him. Maybe more than once. Hopefully, his channel will survive. Keep your chin up, bud. Markiplier is a fascinating character to me, because he seems to have this thematic focus that he returns to over and over again without fully committing to it. He is, superficially at least, militant that art must be experienced in the right way. As 
as a creative person who has made a ton of stuff in his life, he is invested in the idea that art in its purest form means something. The Unis Anas project was about the importance of art, really. Art is temporal, but if you put everything into it in the moment, it becomes worthwhile. Art is like life in that way, so live like a piece of art that gets erased. We will come back to Unis Anas again in the negative section. But I wanted to draw your attention to it here because I think it shows us that as a creator, we can see that he's thinking about more than just being as entertaining as possible to make the most money he can. If this affectation is not some kind of weird PR thing, I, I genuinely do not trust famous people to have anything but abject malice toward me. I, I generally assume that they, they mostly want me dead, to be honest. But I'm willing to suspend my disbelief to, to engage in the exercise. I think Mark probably approaches his Let's Plays, at least conceptually, with the thought that he is bringing something unique to the games he's playing. That he knows his work necessarily transforms the sum of the labor that was already there. And I think he does do that, at least a lot of the time. And to show you what I mean, I'm going to talk about Five Nights at Freddy's. Quick pivot. I am not currently subscribed to Markiplier, and I doubt I ever will be again. Markiplier, more than just about anyone online, has contributed to a lot of wealth going into the hands of Scott Coffin. They have a merch partnership, and as far as I can see, Mark has never publicly condemned Coffin for supporting some of the most reprehensible political agents of our time. And while he's certainly not the only one, he is the one most relevant to this conversation. And I have been chomping at the bit for more than a year for a chance to lace into this fascist motherfucker. Coffin's influence is mobilizing for the far right, and no influence is too small. Not now. Mark's lack of action may not speak to his opinions, but they represent a decision to not advocate for the things he theoretically believes in, when it could affect him. For all the people who claimed, Markiplier made FNAF, I must insist, yeah, he kind of did, and that wasn't a good thing. His silence is passive support for Coffin's brand, and that makes him a tacit collaborator in his political contributions. He said nothing when dogmatic, keep your politics out of my video games nerds began reframing the narrative of Scott Cawthon's donations to bully people who actually rely on politics to survive. When incorrect claims of canceling were being thrown around by people entirely removed from the communities where canceling can take place. By the way, geniuses. Cishet white male CEOs cannot be cancelled, they're not in a marginalized subgroup. Cancelling is when you are publicly shunned within a marginalized community that you belong to. Coffin was criticized. You know, free speechified. And that led to a really hostile environment for those who were actually on the side of the victims of Coffin's political actions. Every single person that came out to condemn Scott Coffin immediately undercut their own feelings of rage and pain to disavow the doxing. If Scott Coffin doesn't disavow the many deaths that will be caused by the reversal of Roe v. Wade, or the attacks on East Asian people and Jews the country has experienced due to Donald Trump's rhetoric, or the teenagers who will die of suicide or hate crimes due to increased vilification of queer people in schools, shit. If he won't condemn the doxing of people who have had the gall to publicly criticize him, if he isn't going to condemn any of that, why is it incumbent upon us to disavow those who legally leaked his political contributions? Politics isn't a sport to most of us. It's life and death. It's freedom and oppression. And a lot of the big names that made this franchise as successful as it is could have been really useful in the immediate fallout of the news breaking if they had just told their fucking gamer bros to relax and think about how this feels for a second. The boys who immediately grab the microphone to shout about free speech, while shouting down the people for whom the right to free speech is the most necessary, the most useful to a functioning society. To paraphrase our great dark mother, Contra of the House of Points, they know what they're saying is reprehensible, so they defend their right to say it. The Republican Party of this century is filled to the brim with fascists and psychopaths. I do not think being anti-choice is acceptable. I do not think that prioritizing the protection of intellectual property rights over trans healthcare is acceptable. I do not think 
supporting fascist rhetoric, reactionary political moves, and the dismantling of the last threads of democracy still in place in this country is acceptable. And Markiplier couldn't control how Cawthon donated, but he could have controlled how he responded to it. I don't know if Mark was quiet because he's a person of color, and therefore anything he might say on the topic would be seen by his own audience as being cough cough political, and I can understand why a non-white man wouldn't want to invite the risk. But honestly, I can't help but see that he could have used his wealth and platform for good, or at least to abstain from continuing to do bad. He simply chose not to. I'm going to go back to alternately praising and criticizing Markiplier now, but I really just wanted to say this explicitly. I have had to do some serious separating of my feelings for the art and the artist in this case, something I have learned to do very sparingly. I wouldn't be giving him the praise that he's going to get in this video if I thought he was an awful piece of shit or something like that. That's not what I think. But I will always side-eye anything he says with regards to politics or marginalized people from now on. And I really wanted to get this into this video because not only have I been sitting on these impotent feelings for almost two years now, but also because if anyone actually watches this video, I'd like them to know where I stand on this. It's good to stand up for what you believe in, actually even if you're not straight or cis or white or male. And I don't care that he raised $100,000 for the Trevor Project. He literally makes that much money a day, and he still got poor people to raise that money for him. Zing! Got him. Anyway. Five Nights at Freddy's, regardless of its utterly unimpressive creator and frankly lackluster story, is a game that heavily engages the nervous system. It works by getting into the mind of the player, forcing them not just to witness, but to feel the panicked mind scattering in a dozen directions. Players are placed in the body of someone fearing for their very life, the tightening in the chest when death is imminent, the straining of the senses to take in every last piece of information necessary to survive. It can't be watched. It needs to be felt. In a vaguely Cajun sort of way, Mark is able to transmit how it feels to play FNAF to a viewer. I think that's probably why his playthrough is so iconic. When he nearly cries of happiness at the end of day five, you're not thinking, I would never act that way if I was playing a video game alone in my room. You're thinking, holy shit, he did it. And you feel amazing because he's shown you how difficult it was and how it feels to have finally beaten this game. It was physically and psychologically demanding and exhausting and he survived. You kind of feel like you survived with him. But this is interesting because doesn't it completely change the focus of the Let's Play? This isn't a video series about FNAF. FNAF is a fatalistic and morbid game about dying over and over again at the hands of the victims of sadistic capitalists. Is there a socialist message in FNAF? No. No, there isn't. We aren't just using Mark as a conduit for experiencing the game. In fact, we've kind of stopped being here because of our interest in the game at all. You aren't watching Five Nights at Freddy with Markiplier in the room. You're watching Markiplier play Five Nights at Freddy's. It's a new paradigm. It's Earth plus plastic. Mark's version isn't just transformative in the YouTube legalese sense. It's literally not the experience of Five Nights at Freddy's anymore. It's the unique experience of a Let's Play. To demonstrate what I mean, let's compare the stories of these two pieces. Five Nights at Freddy's is a video game about working in a children's restaurant with haunted animatronics that want to kill you. In fact, they do kill you. I think? I, I did genuinely mean it when I called the story of FNAF garbage. Scott Cawthon is not a competent storyteller. What the lore? The lore, guys, the lore! The lore! Ring the lore alarms, the lore! The lore! Guys, the lore! Whatever, for the purpose of the immediate story being told, the animatronics kill you after five nights of suffering to make shit wages that you probably need to survive because, as Scott Cawthon likes pointing out in a shamelessly unironic tone, late capitalism fucking sucks. Throughout the nights, the animatronics, who are neglected childhood treasures haunted by the barely conscious souls of murdered children, try harder and harder to kill you. 
Your only comfort, your main tether to the outside world, a guy who had your job before you and is leaving you voice messages, cannot hear you. But, you think, he got through it. Even though it was scary as shit, this is doable. The stakes are raised on the fourth night when we learn that this phone person was killed by the machines. You are then fired because of odor. Which I read as a sardonic comment on the fact that you are dead and your body is beginning to rot. That's Cawthon's sense of humor. And mine, actually, but it's weird for him to have it given he probably tortures leftists in his basement, so it's not even ironic. I mean, I, I don't have evidence of that. I have no evidence of that whatsoever. But I do have faith. And I am not ashamed. Onward, Christian soldiers, my- FNAF is a story about losing and losing and losing. Losing children, losing life, losing dignity, losing your shit more generally, and of course, losing the game. Over and over. Markiplier's playthrough, on the other hand, is about learning. Specifically about learning through suffering and getting more and more engaged with the thing that requires suffering. He starts off in his more performative mode, riffing off phone guy with varying degrees of competence. And already I notice that Mark doesn't comment on the call, but interacts with it. When I tried my shitty reaction to Nevers, my instinct was to keep this running commentary going, constantly judging what I was seeing. Is this a good setup? Is this a compelling conflict? Are these characters distinctive? Let's players, and in this instance, Markiplier, really don't do that. This isn't a review, it's not even a reaction. Calling attention to Phone Guy is just setting up the elements that he is going to be interacting with. It's his first step in building the experience you're about to have. When the call is over, he remarks that he gets it, which feels significant to me in a narrative way. I think of this as a sort of crossing over the threshold in a hero's journey. The moment he understands the stakes and the path forward and chooses to sojourn on. We've also seen how he gets the lay of the land because he's taken the time to call attention to it. Like, making note of the fact that he cannot move is kind of important. We would have figured that out, probably, but it immediately calls explicit attention to one of his many limitations and a defining characteristic of the game, as he alludes to later. Interacting with Phone Guy is the same thing. He could have just silently absorbed that information while talking about other things, but interacting with it, responding to it in hyperactive ways, communicates that we should be listening to what this guy says. Markiplier, and indeed most Let's Players, are not particularly good at filling up silence, in my opinion. When what they're doing is sort of confined to their hands, their brains sort of struggle in the vacuum and they kind of like just try to entertain very consciously. Like, they feel like they need to be on at all times. And I think that makes a lot of them a little bit panicky. Or at least that's something I've noticed with Markiplier. He seems to feel awkward about not having enough to say. So he just kind of yells in that sort of like Patrick Starr yell. The sort of, Hoo! You know, that, that sort of thing. His engagement with the game remains static in this kind of overdone, nostalgic critic fashion until around 4 a.m., at which time he notices that two of the animatronics, Bonnie and Chica, are out of place. That's when the game sort of climbs up through his fingers and into his brain. He slowly stops performing in the most obvious sense of the word. He's actually struggling to survive. At the end of night one, he's not particularly happy to have finished. He's upset that he has to do this shit all over again in night two. Another thing I notice at this point is that while the jump scares are very much affecting me at this moment, him playing the game for me obscures a lot of that terror. I realize that I may not be able to play this game because I might have a heart attack. But Markiplier playing FNAF isn't a horror. If it was, it probably wouldn't have been posted. He dies for the first time on night two, and in his second try, he gets a lot more focused. He starts demonstrating what he's learned. We see that he has picked up on how to conserve energy to last all night, and it comes as a huge relief. You see growth. You're not shitting your pants in fear, but if you're watching this playthrough, that's probably not what you wanted. You feel satisfied that our main character's trials have amounted to something. A skill that will serve him well into the end of the piece. God, it's such a psychological thing! I'm just standing here doing nothing! I'm just standing here! 
I'm literally just standing here. There's nothing I can do but wait for them to come to me. He says that he now has to see things from a new perspective. That he's had a revelation, perhaps? You don't actually need to watch where they are throughout the entire building, considering that they can just jump behind your door at any time. So the most important thing to do is just check outside your door with the lights and check on Pirate's Cove very frequently. Going into night three, he's inviting the challenge. In a moment that I found very funny, he works himself into this paranoid fury and shouts, No, you cannot change rules! No one has suggested that the rules are about to change, but the game is sort of embedding itself into his fear response. Not even fear of a jump scare, I think, but a fear that these skills he's managed to build up will become meaningless. Hence, this comment. I actually feel this strange need to survive. Oddly enough, I feel actually in danger. So if I, if I screw this up, oh God. It's like there's something actually at stake here. There is something at stake. The meaning of the hours he's put into learning how to play this game is at stake. He's actually getting pumped up about a game that was causing him distress just a while ago, when it was easier. So at 5 a.m. I can make it. I can make it even with that door closed. You stay there all you want. I can make it. I can make it. I can make it. I can make it, you sassafras. He's really pumped up for day four when the big twist in the narrative happens. Mark doesn't even look in the CCTVs for like three minutes as he listens to the unfortunate circumstances that have befallen our buddy. Maybe it won't be so bad. Yeah, I, I, I always wondered what was in all those empty heads back there. You know. Oh, thank you! Oh! 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 I didn't check Pirate Cove enough! I was worried about what that guy was going through. How can you be there so early? He acknowledges and teaches us that we can't rely on anything the phone guy says anymore. Because this asshole over here it doesn't even know what he's doing, so how is he going to give me advice when he's already stuffed into a freaking box? This is actually a running thread throughout the game. On night three, phone guy openly acknowledges that his own advice is really bad. <laughs> But if you're more engaged with the story of Markiplier playing the game, you won't necessarily consider this. He is the one directly consuming the story of FNAF, so it seems more important when he acknowledges that the story is interacting directly with the experience of the gameplay. He actually seems really happy after Night 4, and he's ecstatic after Night 5. <gasps> oh my god! I admit it. You're cute. Oh my god. This is easily, easily the scariest game I've ever played. But unfortunately, after a while, after playing it for like a few hours, it does grow a little old on you. But the t it's amazing how the tension is still there. It's a fantastic horror game. It plays on every one of your paranoid delusions. As commentary, it's almost completely unintelligible. But as a Let's Play storytelling technique, it's really compelling. It's like we're watching someone tasked with reviewing a piece, but they're so overwhelmed with their feelings that they can't make a cogent statement. I don't need Mark to comment on the games he plays. Like I've been saying, that's not why I watch him. By the end of the game, especially his 2020-2020 run, the most electrifying part is his quiet focus. Seriously, it's the same as watching any skilled craftsperson doing something they're good at in a high-stakes environment. He's a professional. He doesn't have the time to entertain us. He's not really entertaining for the camera anymore in a conscious way, but he's also not just sitting in a room playing a video game by himself. It's a way better story than FNAF. Oh my god! Oh, I did it! Oh, I did it! Oh god! Yes! Yeah! Unlike Ruby Seal's Pathologic, spontaneous expression is key to conveying how it feels to play the game. Markiplier doesn't focus on explaining what the developers were meditating on, what ideas are baked into the fabric of the piece as a whole. While Ruby Seals teaches us how to interpret a text, Markiplier channels these broad sensations that everyone feels while engaging with the game to open up a door in our passive perception. It would have been a pretty unengaging experience without his work. Unlike Diminish, we are invited to engage with a piece 
with the game on its most superficial level. Nothing becomes more meaningful with commentary or backstory or dialogue. Everything we take from the experience is what we can see. Sure, it's not working on four levels of subtext, we're not chewing on big existential questions on what it means to die or to live, there's no poetry, we aren't trying to understand another person. But I still think there's something rather profound happening here. We are watching ourselves in purely emotional states. An impressionist production of what playing this game looks like without a human being playing it? I mean, Markiplier is a human being, but <laughs> the player of this playthrough is not a three-dimensional person with a past or with an ego. Just the experience arranged in a human shape. The fear, the relief, the sense of accomplishment, disappointment, all these things that Five Nights at Freddy's has to offer don't mean anything without someone who is able to feel those things. Some people have a real knack for feeling them and helping others feel the same way, and clearly Markiplier is one of them. I hope we're starting to put together some of the potential that I'm seeing in Let's Plays. There are more emotions that these things can convey than just superficial horror or entertainment. I think about the huge, oppressive, dense, inquisitive, transcended feelings that I've experienced in playing a game like Pathologic 2, and how hard it's been to process those feelings. Especially because I'm, I'm kind of a baby gamer, and I struggle probably way more than Ice Big Lodge was anticipating, but also because those feelings are kind of big and imposing. And feeling them takes a level of discipline that I, I do have in me, but it also means that I will miss many moments. I can't capture every moment. I don't have the capacity or the knowledge or the sensitivity to engage with every reference, every difficult block of text, every nearly impossible technical trial. I think Pathologic 2 is a perfect game for a really intense Let's Play. But such a product can only work if the player is willing to engage like that. The person would need to be willing to struggle through text, because as Ruby very wisely points out, Struggling is very much a part of that experience. Pathologic and Pathologic 2 have that in common. The player would need to kind of meet the tone of the game where it's at. It's not a game well suited to comedy, at least not in excess. And it's definitely not a good game for endless talking and random anecdote sharing. I'm having flashbacks to that Game Grumps playthrough of Shadow of the Colossus. Oh god. <laughs> Guess I'll go inside while I ride on horseback. <laughs> In other words, it requires a level of emotional and intellectual dedication to the art. And that can't coexist with a fear of being too boring. It doesn't require a doctorate degree. It requires vulnerability and a little determination. And, well, we'll see about that. Now, I could be very wrong about this. There are many, many, many Let's Players that I haven't checked out. But as a relatively young medium, it's hard not to notice that a lot of Let's Plays are, to be frank, a little bit lazy. All creative forms need variety, from easy viewing to things that get the mind working. We don't want people to get trapped in these entertainment cycles where they keep consuming something that requires nothing of them. We all know this, mental anesthesia is to be enjoyed in moderation. And for people who love Let's Plays, there isn't a whole lot of variety out there, is there? Perhaps as the field continues to be expanded upon by innovators like Ruby Seals and Saria, who really give us a glimpse into what the medium can be, we'll see more stratification. People who are more on the entertainment side and those who are tackling projects that are a bit more artsy. But Let's Players have another thing going for them, other than that nouveau shamanic stuff I pulled out of my ass several minutes ago, and I wonder how it might affect that development. As extroverted performing ESFPs or whatever, many professional Let's Players are good at improvisation. They're often funny, they can riff on topics pretty much forever, they can spin stories on the fly, give impromptu speeches, tell really personal anecdotes. And this often means that tiny babies develop crushes on them. But they don't seem to know that what they're experiencing is a crush. Because they're babies. Internet babies. People who become babies on the internet. 
And as a result, these creators tend to encourage one-sided relationships, where audience members come to feel that this very curated section of the person that they are allowed to see is emblematic of the person as a whole. They start to think of them as incomparably generous and kind and deep and brilliant because they are only ever allowed to see the best parts of them, with just enough calculated imperfection thrown in for texture, for charm. This relationship also feels intimate to the audience member, especially with famous people who publicly interact with their fans. It's not a social relationship, it's a parasocial relationship. I know, it's 2023 and you're tired of hearing about parasocial relationships, but I think the trodden ground in this subject mainly has to do with how parasocial relationships affect the people who feel them, rather than the art they ruin. That Walking Dead video by PewDiePie I mentioned was memorable to me because of the effect him crying had on my experience. For others, it was memorable because a cishet man crying is evidence of a pure heart, which I find very frustrating. I originally wrote a section here, uh, not really lacing into Markiplier as a human being, but certainly into his parasocial cult, shall we say, cult in the Roman pantheon sense, not the Jim Jones sense. And it honestly began sounding sort of venomous. I do feel the need to reiterate that I started talking about him and studying him for this project because he made something I really like and he's made things that are really interesting that are, are worth talking about. But just because I've said nice things about him doesn't mean that I have license to just aim all of my criticisms on the, the content creator industry at him. That wasn't fair. That wouldn't have been fair. But I do hope this qualification gives you a sense of how seriously I'm thinking about this stuff. Parasocial relationships are frankly just awful. They hurt people, they poison art, and they generate capital, which is the grossest thing you can say about any relationship. Relevant to our purposes is the way it affects art, let's plays in this case. When your brand is based on whether people want to be your friend, fans will necessarily be predisposed toward liking whatever you make and therefore not thinking too hard about it. I've had little parasocial crushes. I try to be honest with myself about when they happen so they don't warp the way I consume art or the way I look at the person themselves. But that feeling can be really intoxicating because A, unlike in real life, you are getting only the best, most charming parts of that individual's personality. B, you don't have to worry about them not liking you because you will never get a chance to embarrass yourself in front of them. And C, with the internet, you can see literally as much of this person as you want. There is a near infinite amount of time you can spend with them and they can't do nothing about it. Good idea for a horror movie, actually. Often in the comments or chat sections of videos for Let's Players, you see a lot of direct praise and adulation for the person themselves. You're such a good person, you're so amazing, you have a good heart. And ignoring the absolute delusion of that, there is very little commentary about what the performer is doing. Who they are is not a product for consumption. The thing they're making is. Is the thing they're making good? Did it teach you anything? Did it make you feel something new or different? Did it communicate something? Remember, media is communication. The art itself carries something beyond the scope of the human being, but it can still give you access into the person's mind with greater specificity and impact than just words. If you like the person playing the game, observing how they play and how they act out their play should be really engaging. Content creator is a term that is literally pretty neutral, but practically is very charged. When we use the term, we're generally talking about people without specific skills making media that no one would watch if they weren't infatuated with them. Of the many forms of entertainment I find corrosive and slightly abusive, right up there with circuses, sponsored content, and gynecology, content creator stands out as the most insidious to me. And it doesn't have to do with a lack of substance, we all need brain off material from time to time. It's that it's inherently exploitative of very human emotions on both sides. And one of the direct byproducts of that is that art suffers. 
I redirect your attention to Unis Anis. I wasn't around for the Unis Anis project, and I haven't watched a lot of retrospectives or compilations of that material because they're boring. You can fucking sue me about it if you want. All you're gonna win is my student debt. The project had a really solid idea with a pretty simple goal, but I remain unconvinced on the whole with the method. The comparison of art to life is very poignant. Both are fleeting, both can be measured by the quality of experience within them, but both can also suffer from a lack of craft. And as the unexamined life is not worth living, neither, I feel, is the unexamined art piece worth experiencing. And I do think we are going through something of a crisis of examination here. From what I can see, this project was a bonding experience between three people that they slapped a brandable gimmick on at the last minute. It seems like they got into wacky shenanigans. Every day. For a year. And I am left wondering if the rapture evident in the responses of their following was a reaction to content or to a parasocial relationship with content creators. No judgment, because I really do feel, but there is a difference. Look, I really don't have that highest standard of quality I demand in my art, but frankly, I just don't get it. It's boring. Sometimes I just find it annoying. Hey, hey, hey. You close? You close? Hey, you close? I have literally never been farther than I am right now. I'm physiologically incapable of having an orgasm now. Because I saw that. And you have to live with that. And I think that comes down to the fact that ideas are not enough. It takes craft and care to coax ideas into their fully realized states. Good art is hard to make, and it's also hard to perceive. Sometimes it takes practice and craft and time. And while spark and energy and passion, the Dionysian parts of creation, are important, they don't mean much without reflection and care, the Apollonian side. If you were around for this project and you found it moving, that is wonderful. Genuinely. Honestly, it's really great that you liked a thing that these people seem to care about when they made it. That's great. And I do have to commend Ethan, Amy, and Mark for taking on what must have been a pretty cumbersome project and sticking through with it. But as someone who doesn't have that parasocial need to see everything these guys do as deep and beautiful and meaningful, it just feels really hollow to me. It's natural that this erodes the quality of Let's Plays, too. Let's Players being considered as content creators rather than artists leads to a meat grinder pace of unthinking content being churned out at mind-numbing rates. And to illustrate this, I want to tell you about the worst Let's Play I have ever seen. In the early stages of this video, I was watching a ton of Markiplier videos and also reading a lot of pathologic commentary and supplementary material, clearly. And I was overtaken by this flight of fancy. I would kill to watch Markiplier play like 20 hours of pathologic and be confused the whole time. Oh, and I did not mean it in a nice way. It wasn't like a, yes, I, I bet he could really capture the more elusive energy of this game to really embody the, no, 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 no. It was to make fun of him. And yeah, I kind of feel like a dick. And I really don't think he's unintelligent, not at all. He certainly has a wide range of intellectual skills that make him very engaging to watch. Ergo, not stupid. But I'm thinking of him in the same way I thought about Bo Burnham in that video. I don't know Markiplier, chances are that I never will, but by analyzing him as a character recurring in a body of text, I think I can understand what he's doing on an artistic level. And he is, don't forget, an example here. A lot of what I've been saying pertains to most Let's Players. In fact, as I hope I've communicated several times now, I think he's really good at his job. If he hadn't made a fantastic Let's Play that has stuck with me all this time, I wouldn't be talking about him right now. But that also means that his failure to genuinely engage with games really speaks to an industry-wide problem. If he can't do it, 
I don't think the Game Grumps have a shot. Pathologic isn't like FNAF. The fun part isn't on the surface. Like, would he think it was too deep for his audience? Would he just find it inexplicable? Would he think The Bachelor was the only guy with his head screwed on straight? I didn't know. But I had this morbid desire to find out. And then Markiplier played five hours of We Happy Few. And I hated every second of it. We Happy Few is no pathologic. Its attempts at depth are far less successful. They tend to be, like, conspicuous and clunky. You don't get the sense that the developers had a very specific vision in mind for the themes or ideas at the center of the piece. More so that they realized that they had stumbled into a really intense subject and felt the need to elevate the intellectual aesthetic of the game to match it. This is a game about compulsory happiness in the wake of the most devastating and horrific war, the most horrific event of any kind that has ever happened. The creators use literary illusions and devices to suggest a tone that isn't well integrated into the gameplay, the visuals, or the dialogue. It wears its themes on its sleeves, almost exclusively. And Markiplier still didn't seem to understand it, or want to understand it, or he couldn't get into it? I don't really know what happened, but something just did not click here. I don't understand how someone could get so little out of a game that doesn't even have that much going on with it. It's not an impenetrable enigma. It's a Gamer Bros version of a really makes you think film for pseudo intellectuals. It didn't even feel like he was playing it. He might as well have been watching a walkthrough. Uh, sure, mm. fine. Not sure about that. Oh, I don't know, man. Look, I don't know what I'm doing. The occupational authority led by Colonel von Stauffenberg in 1947, gathering a list of all of the children in the community under the age of 13? What part of that seems fine? Of course he'd have to break the cheat to get out. Well, I would break it for everybody. Oh no, is this symbolism? Oh no, is this an analogy? Is this something that pertains to the situation I'm in? If I wanted to be free, I gotta break it for everybody! I'm fine with that, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, it's on the nose, and you still seem incapable of engaging with it. It's a pretty good chant. Take your joy! Take your joy! There's something just surreal about watching a piece that is trying so hard to be dark and, like, claustrophobic and scary, and watching someone just drift through it in a dissociative, borderline, loopy psychological state. If the doors of perception were cleansed, we could see everything as it is. Infinite. What? Pardon me? Huh? Do you drop some acid? What are you talking about? Trying to supplement your joy? It's William Blake, dude. It's William Blake. It's, it's actually really famous. There was a book named after it. There was an entire band in the 60s that got their name after that quote. I should have worn one of my Jim Morrison shirts. I, why didn't I do that? I have a million. I've been obsessed with the door since I was a teenager. Anyway. A lot. Now oh, we see I the killed violence them. inherent in the system. This isn't exactly related, but I kind of feel like Monty Python shouldn't exist in this timeline? Like, that's just the sense that I get. Like, the surrealness of it is kind of hiding a sad, uh, backstory. Like, the, the happiness is to cover up so they don't- they, they don't lose themselves in the sorrow of what happened and- and the loss of who they are. Ah, sorry, I got a dog hair in my mouth. Okay, buddy. Good talk. The undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. <laughs> huh. What the hell are you talking about, man? You spouting poetry over here? It's from the most famous piece of literature in the English language. Marcus. Markwell. Look it up. Yeah, what are they talking about? I don't, I don't even know, so... Let's find out together, Mark. We're literally watching a story unfold. A lot of red flags going up there, too. So, you know the, the old adage, never stick your dick in crazy? Wow, that one's lazy and misogynistic. Fuck you. Well, thank you, Sebastian. Hey, Mark, hope you're doing well. I'm donating because I know there are a lot of people in the world that needs the money. I've been sub... I want to be very clear. The Super Chat. 
That's not for a charity stream. I'm I'm gonna turn off the notifications. We took all the kids to the train station. We sent them off to Germany because of Papier Mache. Papier Mache. Gosh darn Papier Mache. Ooh, take your joy. You know, this is actually a really big, profound moment. Like, I'm still not taking this game too seriously, but. The idea that Arthur feels disempowered by not even having fought, in fact by doing the opposite of fighting, complying with these monstrous demands out of fear, it's actually kind of effective. Like, there really isn't love, or friendship, or familial feelings anymore, because that's just the toll that this war has taken. It's made those feelings unfeelable for the intense need to preserve the self. The center could not hold. The ceremony of innocence was drowned. All that. We can handle death. And pain. And fear. But concentration camps? The massacre of Nanking? The atomic bomb? The wreckage of whole continents? At some point, we just lose this thing called civilization. And we're just going through the motions. There is no more desire for protection for something outside of ourselves in this simulacrum of society. All we care about is the rigid ritualization of what makes us human for the purposes of getting along. This moment of damnable self-preservation in the face of what was a literally hollow threat, that actually kind of got to me. Like. How am I not the one actively playing the game, and yet I am more engaged with the material? That's not fair. He's just not doing his job. Reading back, Unis Honest was conceived because Mark and Ethan were bored with playthroughs. But maybe that called for a change in how they approached their chosen medium itself? There is so much depth there, and I am not an expert, not by a stretch. But he kind of is. If you're bored, with the way you're producing your material, maybe you can change up the way you're approaching the art in the first place. Not as a thing that needs to be generated to keep a conversation going with an audience who condescends to think they know you in the multitudes your human form contains, but as a thing that carries just a small part of who you are. And you don't do that with a PhD in Ludo analysis or whatever the fuck. You do it with care and passion and thoughtfulness. And yes, while I do like being the smartest person in the room, and making fun of people who don't know references is kind of nerdy, I just think there needs to be something more here. Is there a way to fully immerse oneself in the experience of a game like We Happy Few while performing to an audience? There's a machine called the Redactor. Ah yes, thank you, much wisdom. Needless to say, I haven't really found what I'm looking for, and the state of the industry being what it is right now, I'm not hopeful. As long as Let's Players are seen as content creators and not artists, they are going to be given no freedom nor real context to make their work special. And yet, there is a little part of my shriveled up little heart that has some hope. There's real curiosity and ingenuity here. There's a desire to create ambitious and sincere projects. But we may just have to accept the fact that the money isn't going to flood there in the same way it does on the parasocial side. At least not until the revolution. Until then, dock Scott Cawthon, unsubscribe to Markiplier, and give Ruby Seals all of your money because I want that Harris Bex route so bad. To be, or not to be? That is the question. 
whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and, by opposing, end them. To die. To sleep. No more. And by sleep to say we end the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die. To sleep. To sleep perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. 